Okay, so continuing on our um, theme of fabrics and textiles, um, this theme, today's theme was chosen by Shivani from the Saturday Batch. Um, she chose uh, these African prints, I suspect, because both she and I grew up in um, West Africa. Some years of our teenage life, we were in the same school together. So we were exposed to this whole culture. And I feel very sad that at that time, we had very little information about the fabrics as such. So like the Bogolan Fini that we did last year, there is a lot, a lot of culture in um, embedded in the uh, in the prints of these uh, South, so not South, West African countries. So the whole chunk of West Africa, I think, is uh, has relatable stories, which is fine. One culture bleeds into another, and then that grows in itself. So they're not no culture is isolated. So there are a lot of uh, I guess this is one thing that has bled across cultures the fact that what you wear on your um uh, as your outfit speaks uh, something about you even before you uh, need to speak yourself and um, i guess in many if you think about it this can this has also been used in other cultures like when um in uh, definitely in ireland scotland when the tartan print is made in different colors you can spot the clan at least so you don't have to ask where are you from what's what's your family like in from? nagaland also Aditi. is it the shawl tells you the tribe okay that yeah so it's it's uh i guess it's prevalent everywhere i suppose then even in the north uh in the northeast where they have basket weaving even the weaves of the basket can tell you which uh, community they come from. So there are, in various cultures, we will find this. I just realized that there is so much of it in the African prints that we, as also another culture which has so many prints and so many motives, I wonder whether there is certain, there are certain hidden meanings in our motives also, which have now lost significance and maybe they're there in a few places and maybe we need to just uh, find them so i'll share the images and speak a little bit about these prints now i have done very surface level research because i as much as i would love to do research on everything that i teach every week unfortunately um that becomes like a new rabbit hole this means a new life that i wish I had to live. So I'm going to share the sources of uh, information for these prints, where I got the prints from and where I've got the information from. And please freely go through all of them and also go through your own rabbit holes to find out more information. So these uh, prints are now made more on a traditional print um, printing machine. But uh, I have a feeling that they used to be made in wax print. And even the wax batik print style, I don't think uh, is the way the wax print, the way we imagine it, does come from Indonesia via the Dutch. That is the history that I have come across very fleetingly. Um, but even before that, the Bogolan Fini also did resist print dyeing, which was more labor intensive, but it was almost on the same lines, but using mud. So there is something about resist printing that works for all these motives. Now this motive is called uh, the pencil because it is made up of a zigzag line like this. And uh, just to make it more poetic, as much of West African culture is, this was called some president's name and his pencil, <laughs> to give it a little more uh, gravitas, I guess. 
So this motif is obviously a bird um, against a negative oval space and uh, lines which become thick and thin, almost like a Doppler effect. So you have thin lines and thick lines and thin lines, and that creates a nice wave. So the story behind this is, a, not story, I would say there's a proverb behind this print is that money is very fleeting or wealth can be very fleeting. If you don't respect it, don't look after it, it will fly away from you. That's why the bird. Uh, this one is just called salad leaves. I don't know why it's called salad leaves. Now, again, all this information I got from one video and I'll share that with you. That very sweet girl is explaining all these prints in a market. This one is called showers of blessing or alternately, it is also sometimes called light bulbs. <laughs> these, these things look like light bulbs. But if this were an Indian print, we would definitely call them peacock feathers. This has a very nice story to it. So the large yellow circles are meant to uh, represent a well. And uh, I think uh, this is called still waters. Uh, is it still? Yeah, still waters. The dark portion in the center of the yellow circle, this is supposed to be a stone. So you have to imagine a, a huge stone being dropped in the center of a well. And then all these little, 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 little uh, circles or ovals are meant to be bubbles that rise up as the stone falls down. So they're not ripples. They are bubbles that come up. And every all, all these things on the side are supposed to be fallen leaves. That's why they have an oval and a line, an oval and a line. They're definitely distinctly different from what you see in the center here. This piece is called uh, bamboo, sugar cane, sorry, not bamboo, sugar cane. And uh, it is meant to remind you that life is not all sweet, but also not all sour. It comes in, uh, um, I guess, alternating each other. So you will have sweet, then sour, then sweet, then sour, then sweet, then sour. So don't get too cocky and don't get too despondent. This one, I don't know what the name is, but I just love this pattern. And I have seen this worn by Nigerian ladies when we were there. And I um, I love the whole tessellation that it offers. A little bit of meditative Zen art also available in this. So I've chosen this pattern solely for how the pattern itself looks and how we can build it. So when we used to go with our parents to the market, uh, you can imagine the market being very much like a Monday. And often it would be two, three stories tall. So there would be, you could go to higher levels and all. All the fresh produce used to be on the ground floor and all the fabrics and all would be on the top floors. It would be hot because it's tropical. And all these ladies sitting with all the wares, and wearing a, a part of their wares. That entire shop, the store, uh, uh, the market would look like a, uh, pretty much like another kind of assault to me because of the colors. And I never enjoyed these prints when I was there. And once I came back, I realized it's, uh, there's, once you understand the print, they, they become different to you. They can still remain the same colors. They, the, the disharmony exists, yet the meaning changes everything. So many years after we came back, I regretted not getting a single piece made in the fabric from a local tailor, however hideous it would look, just for the sentimental value of uh, having lived there so many years. So... <clears throat> Uh, we will make these prints uh, mostly just as prints, 
But I would also like to show you how to put it on maybe a piece uh, on a garment. Because um, if we, uh, I'm trying to think in what context you would use a print like this. And it always helps to know how to map some uh, textile onto an object. It could be anything right from upholstery to mostly garments. So that when you are making <coughs> pictures, you can uh, look for more than just a, a plain colored uh, garment for the person and that can also enrich your story uh, of the picture a lot. So we'll make four squares to start with. We'll leave the right side blank and then we'll come to what picture we want to make after we've made a certain number of um, these prints. Okay, so as usual, just visualize the space <coughs> from all sides. Oh, I have written mirror work here. So I have to show you mirror work next week. Start making your squares from the center. If you feel the need to make color swatches on the side, you can make them there or you can make them on the side as well. Then in that case, we can move the boxes a little further inside from the edge. So I prefer making my boxes from the center outward. And keep the spacing even. In this process, if you feel you need to make any adjustments to the line, remember to make the adjustment first and then erase the lines that you're unhappy with. If you erase the lines before, there's a chance that you might repeat the same again. You could uh, consider using some of these prints also to make gift boxes. Uh, since we are coming into the gifting season, when I send you the uh, articles and the links to the different YouTube channels that are speaking about African prints, you might see that uh, they will always speak about something auspicious or sometimes they are speaking about what the narrator says is controversial topics uh, by controversial i don't it doesn't really mean controversial as much as in certain cases uh, like for example there is one design which shows a ladder going this way and this way and this way and the color of the ladder is usually black or gray and that is supposed to indicate um, the ladder of death now if you were to gift this to somebody in that culture, it may look like a nice pattern to us, but it may have a completely different connotation. So that is what she means by con controversial fabrics. But you might still want to give 
gift this to somebody as a condolence gift. Uh, maybe they've lost a loved one or you're meeting them after a long, a long time after that loss or something like that. Or you want to give them something um, in certain circumstances where there has been a death or whatever then that would still be an appropriate gift to give, but you should you should know that as well. All right, now let's look at the different prints we have and see how we want to go about them. Let's just plan. So this print is just, uh, you have to just make a negative space. You have to draw this, make an outline to it in black, print the inside either yellow or white and paint the outside blue or sometimes you can paint it red as well. This one, we can definitely make a, a gamboge wash on the entire fabric. This one, we can first draw and then paint. And I'm going to show you how, to, how I use a speedball nib to create this design. This one again, we can paint the entire base gamboge and then paint the blue feathers on top of it. And in this case, also the same thing. I would suggest let's make one of these. I really like this well pattern. And uh, just one motif because we don't have enough room to make such an intricate design six times over. So we'll just make one repeat. Uh, we can make this one also. This is quite pretty. And I pretty much like this because of the ge geometric shapes. So let's do one, two, three, and four. This one is optional. If you feel you want to make another one, go ahead. Uh, and the process of making the sugar cane and this pencil is pretty much the same. And I'll show you both. And then you can choose whichever one you want. So this is the fourth one I leave out. So we have one. Have I over chosen? Yes, I have gone overboard. More than I wanted to show you this, but I didn't choose that at all. Oh, spoiled for choice. Okay, so let's do the bird. Again, we'll just do one motif, not the whole thing. We'll do the salad leaves, the well and this pattern for the geometry decided. Okay, so for the bird, let's make, uh, no, we won't make anything for the bird, but for the well, let's make a circle, a loose -ish circle because we have to, Paint a, a nice golden yellow circle in the center with pink outside negative space. So when you're making the circle also, don't, don't just try to make it in one shot. Move your hand about and make a nice two, three lines like that. And then erase it lightly. In this, you will be able to see the circle. Once you're happy with the circle, just 
lighten the lines a little bit before you paint. So this one uh, uh, square, I'm painting the entire square in gamboge and here the circle in gamboge. Then we'll make the salad leaves on the right and we'll make the, I believe this is the angry wife or something, the last pattern. I don't know why it's called that. And one article I came across, it's, um, I don't know. So it looks as if the wife is angry and turned away from the husband and the husband is turning towards her and asking her to turn back towards him. That is what this was explained as. Can you see that in this? I can force myself to see it. It's a very lovely visual. <laughs> okay, so that one we'll make in the last Are all of you comfortable with uh, making washes now? Or do you still have difficulty? So then while I make this wash, I can help uh, remove those difficulties. Are you still getting patches? Are you still unsure of consistency? Anything like yes. that? Yes. Yes. Oh. Always. Okay. My patch, my, at least I'm not getting clouds. At huh? least not yet. Huh. But uh, not even color, you know, not even like. Okay, so I let's... can see pale things in in parts. Right. Let me go over the whole process all over again then, and then in that you could see what might be the issue. So first and foremost, washes are usually made using uh, tube colors. This thing that we do of digging into our yeah. uh, cake and getting, this is too much for a wash. But we don't go more than this much area anyway. Even yeah. if we were to make an, a wash on an A5 size, trying to extract color from a cake often leads to uneven color patches, even in your palette, because it's never adequate. So if you uh, have another project going where you need washes, do invest in tube colors. And then also look for a nice deep, ink, uh, not inkwell, palette. So look for a palette that will hold a certain amount of medium, like this. So this, this has a depth of maybe half a centimeter. So I can put in a whole lot of medium and I don't have to worry about it drying. In the case of our current palette, there's such little only because we need to spread it only in so much space. I use a very simple math for, for figuring out how much would be enough. I look at a certain volume of the medium on my palette so when we add enough water, you know that it's not just lying flat. There is a little bit of height to this color as well. So I spread it around in an area to see how much medium I have and how much of that, if I spread it in on paper, should be enough. I'm just doing this visually. I have no way of actually quantifying it. The other thing I will also do whenever I'm painting is to dip the brush in water. So when I, when I put one line down, I will take a little bit of water, rehydrate the paint, roll everything up and then come back at it. So I will be constantly changing or, or replenishing the medium either with water or with color or both. When making the um, wash, always hold the book at an angle, at least 30 to 40 degree angle. If you're keeping it flat, that means the color is free to choose wherever it wants to flow. 
In this particular case, we want to control the flow of the medium and we want to ensure that it sits at a particular point long enough for the pigment to settle on paper evenly throughout. So when we place it flat and we try to draw, the line does not, let's say the line moves in all directions. The loose pigment moves in all directions. So just observe how I go about it. All the, all the medium that I need for one wash has to be ready before I begin the wash. I can't make a small sample and then keep adding. At the most, if I feel the need to, when I hydrate the brush, I can go back a little bit into the medium and come back and replenish it. That's as much as I can do. Then the consistency of the paint also should feel like it's going to flow. So turn your uh, palette around a little bit and check that there is adequate flow in the medium. Right. Now with a big fat brush, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to lightly just touch the paper. I'm not going to embed the color into the paper. And because of the angle, the color is going to start coming to the bottom of that line because of gravity. And I keep inserting a fresh layer of paint. But okay, I, why wouldn't you use an up and down stroke? Uh, let me explain. So yeah. at this moment, I'm using this because an up and down yeah. would again bring all my color to the bottom. I want a large surface, wet and still movable, I might say. One, one second, let me just, as I proceed, I will explain that to you. So with every step, I am adding color and I'm bringing the pigment step by step into a new area to, for them to color. Then I will load the brush before it becomes completely dry also. So this is like an active layer. This is like the last bit of fuel in your car. Mm -hmm. You won't go to fill fuel once the tank is completely dry, correct? Mm -hmm. So this is on reserve. But it's still there. It's still working. The moment you start seeing that it has, it's reduced in a few places, you can add more to the brush and come back to it. Now we do want that dry engine at one point. Like maybe you won't want to give your car for servicing on a full tank. So as you come down, you realize that now you don't need any of the running. So you don't reload your brush too frequently. Just use the existing pigment to complete the wash. Now, the reason why we do it horizontally is uh, fairly evident so that we can get a larger area active. If we were to paint vertical, where would the wet layer be? The wet layer would come down and everything on the top will already have started drying. So that the next line that you make, when it touches the edge of the dried layer, you are going to definitely get another stripe. And that stripe will come only till halfway because the bottom half might still be wet. So you won't even get a consistent stripe out of it. <laughs> okay. Now, if you feel you need uh, upright is the only way you can work, um, then I suppose you can, instead of this angle, you change it to this angle. Because... You turn your book is, around. Yeah, so upright is only the stroke, right? But this can become the wet edge then. 
and you can continue to do the same thing but sideways. So, uh, the one thing before I forget, remember that for washes, you need large brushes. In this case, I'm using a brush that is um, size 10. So, I would say something like up to two, three times. Uh, I mean, I don't know how you want to give you a measure. It's the amount of loaded brush. But if you are going to use, uh, if you are going to make a wash on even an A5 size brush, then I would recommend again picking up a flat brush. You get flat brushes in varied sizes. This is a, a half inch or 18 mm brush. You can get a one inch, two inch, five inch. You know how these brushes work. And of course, you have something as large as this also, but this is like a painter's brush. So you can invest in one of those. And then sometimes, like Elaine, like the embroidery thing that you made, if you want to make an entire sheet of that, just use a big fat brush and make a wash on the entire uh, page as well. Washes are meant to be light and they're meant to dry early. Okay, do you want to give it a shot now? And another tip is, if you feel in making these lines, you've missed a spot, let it be. Don't go back to retouch. How do you avoid the lines in between when you're doing, you see the lines? What about it? How do you avoid, you know, it looks like you're making rectangles. Are you uh are you seeing that in this or you you no I'm seeing it in mine in the yellow one is it in yellow okay mm -hmm. one minute. let me it's visible as I take a peek uh horizontal lines going is your paper very textured yes it's textured paper is it a three hundred JSM paper yeah maybe. All right. So I no. find my drawing book, so I just quickly took a paper. <laughs> Never mind. So with uh, three hundred GSM paper, everything changes. Okay. Um. Anything I can do to avoid this? Yeah, you can make a second uh, layer. Oh, okay. Yeah. And also, I'm going to request you to not write the title on top. I just caught that, Janita. <laughs> Titles come last. Just experimenting with African <laughs> typography. Yeah, do the experiment, but on a separate sheet, please. Not on the same sheet. So with 300 GSM paper, the, the pulp used is twice as much as our drawing book. And uh, uh, paper pulp is meant to be very uh, hydrophilic. It enjoys water. That is why it enjoys, uh, we enjoy it with watercolor. It's not coated. It does not repel water. So uh, the, the thicker the paper, the more thirsty it is. I was going to say water hungry. But... I meant water hungry, that you need to then use more water. So very often 
if you have to make large washes on 300 GSM paper, more than an A4 size or A3 size paper, the entire sheet is wet under a dab. So very often, artists will prep their sheets a few days before they use the 300 GSM sheet. You will tape the sheet on a board and then you'll really hold it under your kitchen sink and wet the whole thing till all the pulp is, um, is wet thoroughly and it warps up completely and then it settles back down. So there is a certain amount of dampness. You can begin painting even at that stage. There is lots of moisture or you can allow for a day to go by, let all the pulp settle to a certain extent and then the surface becomes dry enough for you to start painting. But there is enough moisture in the bottom so that it does not totally suck in all the water that you put on your brush so that all you have on top are these flecks of pigment, as might be the case with Janita's work right now. So in that case, you need more water in your medium. You put the first layer very watery, wait for it to dry, which is another thing. It takes much longer to dry. And then you put in put on the second layer. So that's one big reason why uh, the paper in our class is so thin. If we started using 300 GSM paper, uh, it would be a huge hurdle for anyone who is beginning art to overcome. And the time taken for layer upon layer to dry Ours would have been a four-hour class every week. Not that it would we wouldn't mind it, but most of the time we would just be waiting for paint to dry. All right. So now we are going to repeat the same process for the circle. It will the circle also has to be treated as a wash because it is just a plain color in a particular shape. So there's no reason why it should be treated differently. Again, if you here, if you start painting from the center or you start doing some kind of funny stuff, it is going to behave the same way, very unruly. Maybe th that's why I like some things about watercolor. And it's very strange. People might say that this is exactly why they don't like watercolor because it runs all over the place. But I would say that you can, like, you don't really need a strict teacher to keep a class disciplined, right? You just need some authority. And if you know, um, I think it's a, there's a very nice, phrase in Marathi that says kale kale ni gya, which is so interesting because kala means art. So for each you uh, each person or for everything in nature there's a way with which you can uh, you can work with it so that you are victorious. Or even like how Mary Poppins would have said it in a different way. You find the fun and snap. So this last part often can pose a problem if you let it. There's always a blob of extra paint and then that can be very bothersome and then you try all sorts of tricks to remove it. And then you'll paint some extra line or then it starts becoming patchy. So till you become very comfortable with a brush, forget about it. We are going to make some design over it. So even if there's a slight concentration of color in one corner, it's not the end of the world. That's number one. So resist the temptation of trying to even this out. In the event that you do need to even it out, or you pick up color, pick it up before you flatten the book down. Don't pick up after the color has started spreading all over the place. The way to pick up paint is to first dry the brush 
as much as you can on your rag and then just with the tips of the brush somewhere imagine this is the top of the blob somewhere you just make contact with the blob and allow for a few bits of pigment to rise back up into your brush not the whole thing because then you'll leave a white patch over here and then you'll have overcompensated then you'll say oh now i don't like the white then you'll take more color and then you'll start painting and before you know it it's just the end of it okay so now we'll leave these to dry and we'll go to the salad picture So in this case, it's a very simple design. I don't even have to cut it up for you. You can figure out which part you want to take. I'm going to show you how I'm going to draw it. But of course, as usual, you are free to figure out a technique for yourselves also. Whenever I am confronted with a pattern which does not uh, necessarily have one particular tile to follow, I will look for where it repeats so i will look at the red class and uh, study if that is the repeat so this flower on top and this look like they repeat but the yellow flowers after them or between them don't look like they're repeating at all one i would think this and this is a repeat but it's stem comes from here and this one stem comes from here so there doesn't seem to be any harmony vertically now let's look at diagonal we have one flower here then we have this here no repeat no repeat but i can see that the one on the side and the one over here look like they could be repeating now, if the overall shape looks like it's repeating, sometimes the internal shapes can be different. So that is how you just go little by little and you figure out which part repeats. It helps to figure out what one repeat is because then become, that becomes one tile that you can paint and then you can use that for the whole design later on. Now, coming to the motif, even this motif can become very complicated if you're going to draw it motif upon motif. So I break it down like this. Okay, Janita don't paint. Huh? Now watch. Janita and her daughter are exactly the same. They don't watch. They keep doing it. Depends who think it's not drying. What is not drying? No, the paper is thick, no? So you told it will not dry, even for four hours. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't take I I'm exaggerating. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. But your painting, it is not going to dry it. Now, your not painting will dry it. Okay, now for this one, simplify the form by drawing the outline, uh, the curve. This is much easier to draw than trying to draw all these shapes each time. So we won't draw that. Then we will draw the sides of the flower, one of the sides is longer so that becomes the stem also it's almost like a y shape a very very curvy y shape which is capped with a, an oval shape and then you have the internal motif and then you can just divide that cap into one two three four five parts and then you can draw the scallop shape on the inside it'll be much easier to draw this and also it'll be much easier to compose with just a unit of three curves rather than this whole complex flower once you have placed all the uh, basic units then we can make the divisions in the petals and then we can make the internal design and then we can make this external pattern. So I'm going to show you how to do this. We don't have to adhere to the original design to the T. We just take a few cues from there 
and draw our design. So let's start with a floral motif right in the, somewhere near the center. It, the picture, the motif is asymmetrical. So even if we start the design somewhere in the center, it wouldn't matter. So I'm first starting off with this C shape. Pointing towards the right, flexing or convexing towards the right. And then I will draw the long curve and then the short curve coming inward. Once this shape is drawn, I will draw similar shapes elsewhere. So just a curve, it's much easier to draw this. Almost half an oval and then a curve going in the other direction. And from here, I have a stem coming out. So I'll first draw that curve. Other side and an incomplete flower. Doesn't matter. This is the inside of the flower. And then from the other side. At this point, I'm just improvising. There isn't a flower over here like this. But I, now it doesn't matter. I know how the flower goes. After this is done, you can make adjustments if you want. You can now divide this into five parts. So I'll draw a line coming outward centrally. This will become my center petal and then two more on the side. So I have to draw four points in the center here and then I have to draw five petals. And reasonably shallow. Once you know how these petals come for the remaining, you may not even need to make all those dots and everything. This design, we can make the line work in ink or in... Um, Micron pen. I'm using waterproof ink and I will also use my, oh, where is it gone? So these are speedball nibs. I use these to make drawings in, or line drawings because they have a nib like, like this, which has a like a circular disc at its tip. This disc ensures that there is uniform ink flow within a diameter of this measurement. So I can position my ink, a nib down and ensure that I will always get a line that that is as thick as the diameter of this circle. These nibs were used for map making, for engineering drawings, because in technical drawings, you need lines of different thicknesses, but you also need to have them the same thickness throughout. You can't have them thick in one place and then maybe slightly thick in another place. So there would often be a scale on a technical drawing, which will show you the thickness of the line and tell you that, okay, this is the line that shows you a country, this shows you a state. And in terms of machines, it would probably show you that this is the line for wiring, this is a line for something else. So I'm going to use a regular holder. 
And I have used one of these in a previous class before, so I'll use the same one. I keep my waterproof ink in a small inkwell like this. Okay, there has been some spillage, so it's stuck. I think some of it might have also congealed because it is meant to be waterproof. So at, on exposure, it dries and becomes waterproof. Whenever you're working with waterproof inks, remember to decant them into a smaller inkwell and use, don't keep the bottle open because it will keep drying. And as it dries, it starts becoming impervious and therefore also unusable. So until it is slightly sludgy, you can reuse it, you can rehydrate it. But often in bottles, the bottom starts becoming so, uh, well, no, sometimes it's the sides also. From different areas, you will see that the ink has started to get hard. And then you won't be able to use it. It just dries up. Then I also keep the ink in another container like this because I've had lots of accidents where without wanting to, something tips over, something happens. So nowadays I'm prepared for earthquakes. Uh, once I finish my art, the water is discarded immediately. I don't keep the water near my electronic devices. Everything is covered, sealed, and put away as if in case that even if there's an earthquake, there's never going to be any damage. What is the name of the nib? And is there a particular size? Yeah, the, this is a speedball nib. And the size that I'm using is called a B5. And you can get a set of uh, eight and the the sizes range from b half like this big fat one to i think b6 or b7 this is the second thinnest one that i have okay so this process is for the series or also speedball like a particular b nibs speedball b nibs Okay, now I want you to just see how this works. All I need to do is maintain my pressure. And the angle. And it will give me one consistent line. Uh, if I'm not getting that consistent line, it's not the nib's fault. It's my fault.
if you enjoy making a lettering also which is slightly rounded in its edges this is a delight to work with so we have to just be a little more conscious of our grip often we write with the grip where the pen is at an angle of maybe 20 degrees 30 degrees and this one we have to keep it upright almost a uh, 60 degree uh, sorry more than 70 degree angle if not completely 90 degree so that takes a while and then of course the speed i wonder why they call speed ball they should actually call no speed ball speed limit ball I used to have that textbook or that speed ball writing yeah. book with the pen. Somebody had gifted to me years and years ago, which I then gave away because I never did anything with it. It's a very nice book. I copied a lot of those Roman things, you know, to write those dropped capitals and those fancy yeah. letters. I used to do a lot of that in college. Oh, really? Ooh. Yeah, I didn't meet anybody who taught calligraphy. Okay. <laughs> Some tickets now. I personally enjoy this because I like the um, the darkness of the ink is much nicer sometimes than our uh, micron tip pens. And secondly, the amount of ink that is needed for some art uh, project is to, I, I think I, I hate to use a disposable pen for some places where I have to fill in a lot of ink. So then I prefer this dip pen. When I see videos on um, Instagram or YouTube of people making these huge artworks in black and white ink and they will sit and color with the small micron tip pen with every line that they're shading i'm feeling nervous and nervous how many ink how many pens did they discard in the making of this one artwork I had bought a Faber Castell artist pen set once, uh -huh. which has 1.5, 1, you know, all kinds of, and one red one. Four or five of them came in a pack. Okay. I couldn't resist it. I never used it. But <laughs> today, the 1.5 is coming in. Very good. But I do have some waterproof ink. But it's mm -hmm. blue. It's artist pen, it's called. A small, medium, and then 1.5. Strange. And a red one. I call B. You should one day just sit and do some time pass with the pens that you have. Like, take a tool out and, especially one that you've not ever used, bought, and say, I'm not going to do anything. Uh, with anything else except this one and see what you come up with. I also own a little wooden thing with a with a flat black sponge at the end of it, which I always wonder what kind of calligraphy was ever done with that. Yeah, you should, you can do that on fabric or something like that. 
Okay, I'm going to continue this same design with the uh, ink. This time I'm using my uh, uh, dip pen. But this is just like a micron tip. Now here we have certain lines which I would recommend make them freehand. Don't make them in pencil first. It will save us time. And also, it will make things look a little casual and uh, in tune with what the design is trying to do. Now, if something like this happens, you don't have room for the fifth piece. Add it from here. instead of sticking it to the edge. The internal design of this salad leaf is too complex, but I would probably just do something like that. With the micron tip, we can do it. Make, an, make a line on the inside, a shape like this. That's the, the internal line. One teardrop shape in the middle and then either some dots on the edge or lines or both. So I could make lines or dots, some kind of texture that I can easily repeat everywhere and then color in between. So at least we have some pattern doesn't all have to be blank. Now visualize how this pattern will look in all the other flowers. So Janita, next time when we're making a pattern uh, that's very, very detailed, na? look for a slightly smoother paper. In this textured paper, all of these things will become very challenging for you, I, I feel. Making I a very ask you, like when you erase, the paper literally comes out. So I used to banish it too. I think burnishing tool it is. I smoothened it. So it made it a bit better. But even then the fibers just peel off. Yeah, you're not supposed to erase. So you don't erase like the lines that you have on your paper of this pencil. This paper yeah. is yeah. different. This is a different paper. Your 300 no, no. SM. When we work on the 300, how do we erase? One so just... No, so one thing is you don't draw too dark. 300 GSM paper is often used for, um, for let's say, landscapes for the most part. Now, in the landscapes, whenever an artist makes the, uh, makes a landscape in pencil, they don't make a full line also for the horizon. You will see that they'll just mark more or less a dashed line for horizon, maybe a line here or here for some foliage, maybe some mountains, some basic trees. If there's a house or a hut, some focal point, there you might find a little more line work. But for the most part, no erasing. And especially after you've started putting color, forget about erasing because that color seals the pencil in. There's no point in erasing. Okay, so this is repeating. I'll, I was hoping that I would be able to finish at least one of these. <laughs> So 
So a pattern like that can be made so easily in waterproof ink. And you can keep coloring all these uh, thick blobs to your heart's content and not feel guilty. Now the next part in this pattern is the, are the various lines in between. And for this bit, if you feel the need to, you can use a pencil, at least for the first part, to figure out where the lines go. So I have some lines coming from, say, this flower that radiate from the center, maybe. Like maybe something like this. There's a big blank space. I don't know what to do about, so I'll come back to it. And then some places they cross over. So I'll have these lines, which are radiating. And then they also meet the radiating lines from an adjacent flower. So all sorts of things are allowed and available. But basically, you would want the flower to radiate its glow in the form of these lines, something like that. And those lines are also not all straight and parallel. As they come closer, they look narrow at least. So let's go. Try to keep the lines closer by the petal side and a little further as they go move away. Like from the sides, this is how those rays move. Hmm. And once your basic line is drawn, you can make them thick and thin wherever you want to. So I could probably make them thin there. And then as I come to the end, I could make them thick. All right, now we have just about 10 minutes for the next design. Can we just figure out how the next design can be made? Because I'm fairly confident that you will be able to make the pattern or print yourselves, right? For the others. The bird print is not very difficult. Uh, as far as the well is concerned, again, I can draw it quickly and I'll show you. So if if uh, you have any doubts, you can watch the video.
So you start off with the center. And just to make sure that you are drawing in the center, again, use some tool that's handy to measure the top and bottom. In a rare case like this, if you really want to make uh, an artwork that you want to put on display or something, feel free to use geometric equipment huh, to mark this out. Now, after this has been made, there is some vacant space around it. So you will make a concentric circle around the main circle, around our stone. And then in order to organize all those water bubbles around, divide the circle at only the center okay. into equal parts. So you know uh, all our uh, north, south, east, west, and the directions in between. And then the spaces in between that. So evenly divide all these spaces. That becomes your starting point. By the way, this design is also something that carries from right in the center. It's also part of the design. I, I shouldn't have made it here. There are lines that come out of the center of the circle as well. And then at the ends of these, or not at the end, at these points, you can start making those smallish ovals. And they will always, all of them will be equidistant. So it takes, it helps to take a little bit of time to measure out the space and uh, mark the spot. Once you have made the first circle of ovals, then you make the second one with slightly larger ovals in the space between the first circle. And then at every point, just keep increasing the size and the distance between. And you just maintain the angle so that at every point, your ovals are always pointing outward. They're not, not perpendicular to the circle. Okay, so if you can just give me 10 minutes and we can finish this part. The last part is the angry wife design. You might be able to figure it out yourself also, but I thought I could in a previous class and I thought out a very complex solution for this. So I want to go over the solution. You might have done this before and you can do it a different way also if you know it. And if you know a simpler way, please do let me know also. Okay, so we start off with triangles. And I'm going to break this down into triangle spaces and show you how to build in that space. So first and foremost, identify the horizontal lines. We just go through all these centers, center, 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 center. Then we have diagonal lines. We don't have vertical lines here. And then we have lines on the opposite diagonal. The starting point of this design is hexagons or triangles creating hexagons. Then we identify the center of 
the triangle and from there we can draw lines to the corners of each triangle. And then we change that to a curved line curving towards the uh, in an anti-clockwise direction. So each of these triangles, we have to draw curves coming towards the center from all three apexes. And each of those curves is curving towards the right, to its right. Once that is done, we will have the basic pattern. And then we have to follow the texture. The texture is such that it starts from the apex towards the rounded edge, always. So you have straight lines which are converging from the apex and then spreading out in the rounded section. You have the same thing on the blue part here. And in the red part, again, it's straight on the straight side and curving, radiating outward towards the curved side. So every place we have to follow the same. Don't even bother about this, the different colors. They're all doing the same thing. Straight edge, straight line. Straight, 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 curve, 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 curve. Once all the lines are made, then we can color in as well. So pretty much like how we did the salad leaves, we can make this also. Had we had permanent blue, uh, brown colored ink, we could have done that in this design as well. Okay, so I'm going to share this construction with you so you can at least observe it. It's actually like a Zen tangle. It is. It is a Zentangle. I'm fairly mm -hmm. certain I've seen this as a Zentangle pattern. Mm -hmm. I don't seem to even get the triangle. I'm just getting diamonds for some crazy reason. So I'm gonna... No, it will be a diamond, uh, Elaine, when you kind of a rhombus. It will come like a diamond shape. Oh, no, it's two triangles. <laughs> but this will be, it'll be such a wonderful <laughs> exercise yes. for the for the head, what yes. we see, what we perceive and what things are. I started out the basic design. The mistake that I was making in the previous class was to start out with a hexagon. And then somebody very politely said, but isn't a hexagon made out of tiny triangles? <laughs> I thought, yeah. <laughs> Why did I not think of that? <laughs> no, I know this. I mean, I'm just drawing. I'm not even thinking of triangles. I'm just drawing as I, you know, just... And it does, it comes into diamonds and then I don't know what to do after the diamonds. I don't know. So have fun with it. There is yeah. so much that you can do if it's diamonds. It, it could be, Elaine, that you are you're taking two triangles and you have uh, juxtaposed them like this so that they're looking more like a rhombus shape, like Neeta was saying. Lines which were straight and lines that were slanted. Just as you did. I didn't get triangles. You got triangles. Yeah, so, so <laughs> just figuring it out. <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> there are various solutions. Okay. So try no, with I them whatever floats your boat. <laughs> okay, so uh, hopefully this week I will finish both the pages and I'll share the recording. If not, if I don't finish also in a couple of days, I'm going to share both recordings. Uh, last week also I couldn't do it because I was waiting to finish and then, <laughs> then I fell ill, so I couldn't do anything. How are you feeling now? Okay. Now I'm okay. And if there are any signals of weakness, I'm choosing to ignore my body's signals now. I've given it enough time. Now beyond this, I'm just spoiling it. So I should no, no. not do it. It's giving you the correct signals. You you punish it now, it will punish you later. It's Hardly true. punish. I'm not <laughs> punishing it. I have to just tell it now. Okay, I get the point. I did what you asked me to do now. I'm payback. <laughs> But no, I'm seriously, I'm okay and much better now. And I don't know what hit me. So I don't even know what to avoid. So no, it's just a bug that everybody yeah. is getting. But hopefully everything will be fine. Okay, so uh, next week, in case I do forget, please remind me, we will do mirror work. 
we have one more class for this now. So we'll do that, Mirabak. I'd like to show you how to do that as well. Uh, if you have samples to share them because then that helps. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. And uh, is, is Nita still there? She's here. Yeah. Nita, can you explain how these become triangles? Later on, you're the maths. Genius. No. See, first no. you draw you draw the horizontal lines, then you draw the... Uh, That's the what I did. Exactly. <laughs> then did you draw the it direction? together? No. No, I haven't drawn the other ones because I don't know. Yeah. They, they crossed weirdly and then it was neither, you know, triangle or diamond. So I rubbed it out. Okay, wait. So I'll, I'll just, I'll do it with her face to face. The only way I can do it is with Nita face to face. I'll do that. No, she'll she send come over her, anyway. uh, Aditi, you can send us the picture. I I've, I've, yeah, I've taken I'll a screenshot of that. With you. Yeah. yeah. And also, <laughs> you. these are, I think these are all equilateral triangles. So they'll be 60 degree angles. Yes, that's yes. That's the point. If you don't get that correct, then you're, that's it. That's, so I'll do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, have fun. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Achha, once one thing, I I think you had uh, put somewhere that uh, the fees has increased to 25. From August. I, oh, I'm so sorry because I paid two and then I saw somewhere a uh, notification. Oh, so, uh, I, Next yeah. month. I also have just paid the old fees for calligraphy and this together. So no, I'm next really month you can pay the new fees. It's okay oh. because I had changed the fees in Jan for all new students. And okay. for the old yeah. students, I hadn't even communicated. So oh. when I came back, I had very, very quietly put it on the on a note. I and happened to then, read that and then I uh, realized I've already paid. I it. never even read it. Next yeah. month. I don't think she's as usual. Okay, okay. Sure. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.